what I'm hearing and what I've been hearing all morning, that God is wanting to minister healing to you right where you are. I've been feeling and hearing arthritis, arthritis pain in your knees, in your hands right now. And, and even as God began to speak those things over me, I said, but God, usually, you know, your word says to bring, bring those, bring those forward so we can lay hands on them. And in this moment, and in this time, we can't do that. And he said, they're going to lay hands on their self today. And we're going to pray and we're going to speak healing. So right now where you are, whatever pain you're experiencing, I really feel very strongly that there's some arthritis going on. I even felt that this morning before I got here. Any area that you're feeling inflammation and pain, I want you to lay your hands on it right now. We're going to pray. God, just begin to minister healing in these homes this morning, God. Healing of joints, inflammation and pain is gone in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your healing power that has no boundaries. It has no walls, God. It goes beyond where we are, Jesus. It meets us right exactly where we are in this moment. Bedrooms and homes and kitchens, God. Right now, your healing is flowing in those, Lord, God, that need to receive this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Receive that healing today. Depression has to go in the name of Jesus. Anxiety, God, these, these things, these events that are happening in the world right now are triggering for some. They're triggering traumatic events that have happened maybe years ago that you've already dealt with and you felt really good for a long time. But this uncertainty and this instability has triggered some things in your mind right now. We speak over your mind and we say anxiety. You have to go in the name of Jesus. Depression in the name Jesus, you have to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. He, Jesus. Huh. He's faithful. He's faithful. Just receive that this morning. Just lift your hands where you are. Receive his healing. Receive his ministering this morning right where you are. We're not confined to these four walls, guys. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Come on, babe, sing that out.
Lord, that with you, that nothing compares, Lord, that your name is above anxiety. Your name is above depression. Your name is above arthritis. Your name is above the coronavirus, God. Your name is above every doubt or fear or insecurity, God. Your name is above every other name. There's nothing that rivals your name, Jesus. There's nothing that can compete with who you are. God, and we thank, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that just during a, a time like this, God, that you are consistent, that you stay the same, God, that you're unwavering, Lord. God, our trust lies in you, God. Our hope lies in you, Jesus. God, we thank you that when we do build our life on your foundation, God, God, that you have great things, Lord. God, that you see the final outcome of every circumstance, God. And so our trust can reside in you, God, and we can do it full forcibly, God. Lord, I thank you for every person watching this morning, God. I just ask for right now, God, just in these last moments of worship, that you would invade living rooms, God. You would invade bedrooms right now, God. That every heart, God, every ear that's hearing this morning, God, that your presence would just radiate, God. God, that they would feel your love and your peace and your protection, God. You're such a good father. You're such a good father.
standpoint, and uh, I want to start out with a couple of questions. Should the Christian, and that's us, church, that's us, I'm talking to us, should the Christian have the same panic as non-Christians? Should the Christian have the same panic as non-Christians? Do we have hope? a protector, a comforter that maybe they don't have. The answer to that is yes. Everyone wants to claim Psalm 91 over themselves. We all want to claim that. And God wants us all to claim that. He wants everyone to claim that. He he says he would that none should perish, but all should have eternal life. He wants everyone to claim Psalm, 90, uh, Psalm 91 over themselves. However, verses 1 and verse 14 of Psalm 91 limits that promise. And so I want to talk to you about that today. You're only limited by yourself. Let me preface by saying that. You're only limited by your choice. But I want to read to you we're going to start out in Psalm 91, in verse number 1. So go ahead and turn there with me. I'll give you a second to get there. God's good. Hey, while you're turning there, I just want to tell you that we love you, and uh, we're praying for you. Came up here the other evening and just walked through these chairs and remembered who sat where. And I just laid my hands on those chairs in representation of me laying my hands on you. We're praying for you, and we're going to get through this together. Amen? God loves us. He hadn't forgotten us or forsaken us. And this is just a season, and it's going to pass. Amen. Psalm 91 and verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. There you go. That's limiting. That limits us because some of us choose not to dwell in the secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers. Under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys in midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but I will, it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. I'm in verse 9. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, 
and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and on the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, in verse 14, because he loves me, says the Lord, that's a little limiting, because he loves me. If you love him, this promise is for you. If you choose not to love him, come on. It says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's one of the most powerful and comforting promises that you can find in the scripture. But the promises stands only through you. Through you loving God and you dwelling in the secret place. Mm -hmm. Come on, I want to talk to you about that for a minute because uh, he puts it in our kitchen. He makes us make a choice for that promise to work in our life. He makes us decide. He gave his life for everyone. I already mentioned that. But not all will live under this promise. What does that even mean to dwell there? Well, I'm glad you asked. Those words have a spiritual meaning. How many of you ever heard home is where the heart is? The one who dwells with God God is the center of their affections and their thoughts. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, it's Paul talking, and he says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What are some characteristics of people dwelling in the secret place? A secret place dweller loves to be alone with God. A secret place dweller worships within the veil. They go to a deep place. A secret place dweller engages with God in solitude. We should all be like David. Come on, a man after God's own heart. Was he perfect? No. But he was chasing after God with everything inside of him. When he fell down, he got back up, dusted it off, and went on. Come on, that's who David was. That's how we should go after God. Yeah. Come on, church. We need to love God and pursue a relationship with him the best we can. Am I calling you to perfection? No. I'm not. But I'm calling you to have a heart longing after him. Psalm 42 verse 1 says, As the deer pants for water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. Let desire for God begin to consume you. I promise if you seek him, you'll find him. If you seek him, you'll find him. A secret place dweller also makes confession of his faith. A secret place dweller makes confession of his faith. Psalm 91, that we just read, in verse 2, it says, I will say of the Lord. I will say of the Lord. Confess. Verses 1 and 2, the psalmist declares six names of God, six ways he is revealed, most high, almighty, the Lord, refuge, fortress, and my God. We could talk all day just on those names. 
just on those confessions. Confession is a vital part of faith. How many of you know faith is just believing that God's telling the truth? Confession matters. What is your confession proving that you believe about God? Remember I just said faith is believing that God is telling the truth. What are you confessing? What's coming out of your mouth? Make sure you're not contradicting what you believe with negative confessions. Make sure you're not contradicting what you believe with negative confessions. Proverbs 6.2 says you are snared by the words of your mouth. Proverbs 18.21 says death and life are, are in the power of of the tongue. The power of the tongue. What you say matters. Let's talk about God's protection of believers. God's protection of believers. What will God save you from? Psalm 91 was very clear. The snare of the fowler, deadly pestilence, terror of night, arrows that fly by day, pestilence that stalk in darkness, the plague that destroys at midday. Come on. God will protect us. Y'all know the scripture says no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Psalm 91 verse 7 says a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. It shall not come near you. This is an encouragement to not fear what others fear. You don't have to be afraid. How will God do it? How will he protect you? By commanding his angels. He said so. They'll pick you up in the palm of their hands and keep you safe. And God will answer your prayer. We need to pray. The World Evangelical Alliance has called today a global day of fasting and prayer. Today. March 29, 2020 a global day of fasting and prayer. That's a call that when they when they sent that out, World Evangelical Alliance sent out that call to 600 million Christians. 600 million Christians were taking part in that today. We're going to pray together in a little while. I'd invite you to fast, give up something today for our nation, for this globe, mm -hmm. for the world. Give up something today and pray. Prayer is important. God will keep his promises. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. I think we're guilty of that. Psalm 91 verse 16 says, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. He is faithful. He will keep his promises. It's God's promise for obedience. A long life. A long life. Thank you, Lord. I said a long life. Come on, don't worry about what's coming at you. God's word's covering you. If you're a Christian, if you're dwelling in the secret place, if you love him, his word surrounds you and he promises you a long life. Yeah. We can have confidence even in plague times. We serve a God who keeps his word. 2 Samuel 22, verse 26, out of the New Living Translation says, to the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To those with integrity, you show integrity. What God promises in Psalm, in Psalm 91, he will perform when we stand upon his word and trust in him. One last observation before we close, and it's kind of a big one. I want you to turn with me to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. I read this scripture and I began to understand a few things. The Lord began to reveal some things to me. And I just want to give them to you, a few nuggets, before we go on about our day today. I'm going to read a big portion of that scripture, verses 1 through 13. 
And I'm just going to take my time. We're not in a hurry, are we? Exodus 12, 1 through 13. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of person, of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. You will keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. And then verse 11. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, there is a ton in that scripture. We could talk the rest of the day till night about that scripture. I won't do that. I do have a few things I want to bring out, a few thoughts about that passage that I want us to still look at. The first one is, don't let your lamb be blemished. Don't let your lamb be blemished. Your praise must be pure and undefiled. Come on, I'm going to give you a second to let that sink in. Don't let your lamb be blemished. Your praise has to be pure unto him. We praise him because he's worthy, not for our own gain. We praise him because he deserves our praise. The second thing, you must be under the blood to be protected. Come on. You must be under the blood to be protected. No more riding on the shirt tail of mama. Right. Mm -hmm. You must be under the blood to be protected. To, it, to it, What am I trying to say? Sorry. To receive the promises of God, you have to be under the blood. You have to have an experience, a relationship personally with him. Right. He instructed them to paint the doorposts and lintels of their houses with the blood. Everything that you let in your house must be under the blood. What are you letting in? What are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you partaking of? What's coming into this house? Everything that comes into your house should be under the blood. Yeah. Praise God. I like this part. Do not eat anything raw or boiled. Everything you eat must be roasted. 
Well, what's that got to do with anything? I'm going to tell you. Anything that will sustain you must have gone through the fire. It can't be boiled. It can't be raw. Anything that will sustain you must have gone through the fire. So you feel like you're going through some fire? That's okay. God's going to sustain you through that thing. He's going to use it as a blessing in your life. He's going to use it to push you forward, to catapult you right into what he called you for. Do you feel like you're in the midst of fire? Do you feel like you're in the skillet being fried? <laughs> He has a plan for that thing. He's going to use that. Burn. He went on to say, burn and he let anything that was left over, burn it up. Consume it in fire. It tells me he will give you what's sufficient for today. You can't live on yesterday's blessings. He don't want you to save it up. He wants you to dig again tomorrow. Get in his word again today. Get in his word. Seek him. Pray. Again. Do it again. You can't just want it done. You've got to keep this thing going. You've got to continue in prayer. Continue in fasting. Continue in his word. Because he will sustain you through a new, fresh revelation. His word's new every day. His blessings are new every day. Get in his word today. In verse 11, it said, And thus you shall eat it with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Remain dressed in the whole armor of God. I talked about that last week. Mm -hmm. Remain dressed in the entire armor of God. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Mark that in your Bible, man. Get, get something marked there. Read it, read it, read it. Put the armor on, put the armor on, put the armor on. Be protected by his armor. If he says the last thing I want to tell you, if he says, stay in the house, he told them, go into the house. Paint the blood on, go into the house, eat the lamb, burn up what's left over, and stay there. When I pass by the blood, I'll recognize the blood to know to pass by your house. It's covered in the blood. If he says, stay in the house, stay in the house. Word, Listen, I'm thankful. I, I'll just say I don't. Uh, I don't understand that separation of church and state. I am the church, and I am the state. So I'm just going to say it. President Trump said, "Separate yourself." He suggested that we do that. I'm not talking about President Trump. I'm, I'm glad that he did that. I'm glad he's trying to lead us progressively. And try, I'm glad he's trying to be proactive. I'm trying. I'm glad that he's trying to take this thing by the horns and take us somewhere. I mean, at least he's doing something. Come on. <laughs> and we should follow his leadership. I believe that. Do I like it? Do I like preaching empty chairs this morning? Absolutely. I do not like it. I love for you to be here. I want to hug your neck. I want to love on you. I want to see your face. But I'm telling you today, he, God said, put the blood on the doorpost and get in the house. I'm not telling you he's saying that to you today. But if he is, do it. If he tells you to stay in the house, stay in the house. Protect yourself under the blood. Under the blood. Under the blood. Mm. Huh. I want to ask you, I started with a couple questions, and I'll end with a couple. Are you lacking God's peace right now? Are you lacking God's peace right now? Are any of you experiencing difficult times? He's faithful. He's faithful. He's still God. He hasn't changed his mind about who he is or what he wants to do. Let yourself connect with this word. Listen, this is not my word. It's his word. Let yourself connect with it. Open your heart, your mind, receive it today. Take it on. Let this word get inside of you. I want us to pray. I want us to turn our troubles over to him today. If you're facing trouble, if you're feeling alone, left out, abandoned, if you feel like you're coming up short, get in his word. 
Man, spend some time with him. It's what's important anyway. We've replaced him with other things. And it's affecting us right now. I mean, that's just the, the fact of the matter. We've replaced him in our life with church. He tells us to come together and assemble together. And I'm glad that he told us that. I love the church. I mean, hello. I love the church. But I think we've gotten so accustomed to just what we do as Christians that we've forgotten really this thing's about a relationship with him. Amen. It don't matter if I'm on the back side of a hill somewhere or in my house or at a congregation with someone. He is the center of the attention. So it shouldn't feel so awkward. It shouldn't be so awkward that we've just removed ourselves a little bit from one another. We still have him. He is still there with you. Amen. He's wherever we are. He lives inside of us. So call on that thing. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart this morning. Let it awaken today. Awaken today. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus right now, Father, I ask you that anyone who feels alone, God, that you would just flood them with the fact that you are right there in their midst. And if God be for us too and the world can be against us, we are covered. You've got us covered. You've got us covered. Father, anyone that's facing trials today, God, we walk through life, and, and you say we're going to have trials, and it's difficult to walk through trials by ourselves. It wasn't your intention that we walk through trials by ourselves. You even gave us a body to walk through trials with. And Father, as we're separated as a body, as we're scattered abroad, Father, in different places, Father, I just ask you, do what you can do, Father. Only you can do that. Father, I ask you just to let us feel this group, this connection of community, Father, even though we're not face-to-face. -face. Father, by your Spirit, that you would draw us together. Father, we can reach out to one another. We can pray with one another through this awesome tool of social media and phones that we have, God, I just ask you to let us be creative in ways to connect. Walk this life out. But Father, you're always with us. You're shouldering the thing that we're trying to carry. The thing that we weren't ever intended to carry. Have your way in us today, God. Have your way in us today. Let us feel your presence. We love you.
If our president and our leaders, our businessmen and women, our church leaders, extra wisdom right now, right from the throne of heaven, God. Strengthen your church. Oh, God, strengthen your church. Strengthen your church. Revive us to who you we you have called us to, that we can partner together to reach the needs of those around us. Lord, I saw yesterday in Houston at CT Church the great, huge giving of food, Lord. And we are here to give, Lord. And I know other, other places, Father, where there people are in need, God. So let us mobile and, and, and together, God, to reach those who are in need right now and show the love of Christ. Father, calm our fears. Calm our anxieties. Fill us with your hope. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your peace as we continue to trust in you. Because we do trust in you, Christ. Our trust is in you, Christ. Our trust is in you, Christ. Use this time, Lord, to pave the way for spiritual renewal. We want your glory, power, and healing to be on display. We want to make you famous, Jesus. We want to make you famous. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come.